Hello, everyone. Oh, sorry, I forgot to do the intro. Welcome to Paranormal Palace Radio, where truth equals reality, and truth is often stranger than fiction. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Paranormal Palace Radio. This is your host, uh, Royce the Redneck Radio Man, and joining me today is going to be Bernardo Castro. We're going to talk about uh, Dreamed Up Reality and what he has to say about it, and he's written a whole book on this, so let me get him on the phone real quick or in, in here with me, and we'll go from there. Hey there. Hello, Bernardo. Hey, Royce. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. I had a last-minute restart, lost my signal, didn't know if it was the computer or if it was my Internet service provider, so, so I did a restart just hoping for the best. Let's hope it doesn't happen halfway through it. <laughs> I know. You had to depend on other people for your signal. You can get scary sometimes. But, uh, yeah, let's go for it and make the best out of this. And I want to let you know, I, I just, before uh, putting you on the line here, I went ahead and started the show so that we could go from there, and I gave you a you know, quick introduction there, and I mentioned it about your book and what today's going to, you know, we're going to talk about today. So, so all this um, already happened. Pardon me? This already happened. You already gave an introduction, you said. Yes, sir. Okay, okay, I understand. It was a kind of a brief one, though, uh, and, you know, in all honesty, you could probably do a better job than what I was doing uh, based on a bio, because uh, I usually ask my guests to, uh, you know, Tell the listeners a little something about themselves and what got them interested in their particular area of interest. So if you want to start this out, I think that would be a great way. Uh, you know, tell them what was it that got you interested in, uh, you know, reality research, I guess you could call it, couldn't you? Sure, sure. We can talk about that, yeah. Okay. So what was it that, you know, first sparked your interest in this? Are we on air? Uh, yes. Just, okay. yes, sir, we are. Okay. Um, well, as you probably saw in my bio, I, I, my original background is, is very scientific, even scientistic, I, I, I dare say. Uh, my education was in, in engineering. Uh, I have a, a PhD in computer engineering. I've worked in physics laboratories uh, in different countries like uh, CERN in Switzerland and uh, Philips Research in, in the Netherlands. And um, mm. so I have this very rationalistic background, and uh, I, I used to think – uh, until a few years ago that, you know, science was very close to finding out the answers to all the important questions and, you know, the, the only thing that is missing are a few details and fine-tuning here and there. Um, but then I realized that, no, no, that, that that is not the case at all because the more you get into science, the more you, you realize what the game really is, what, how science really works, what are the, the underlying assumptions of science and how they may not be valid after all. And... Um, and largely motivate, motivated by some personal experiences I, I've had, uh, I got into this, into, into this attempt to, to look beyond uh, the strict process of scientific methodology to, to basically stick to more basic stuff like empiricism, rationality, and logic and try to look behind the curtains and, and see what is in there. And uh, it's been quite a ride uh, so far. <laughs> Well, you know, when I was reading your book, it sounded like it was quite a ride, but I, I thought you made some excellent points in there, and uh, I don't know if this is going to surprise you or not, but while reading it, I, I was re kind of reminded of uh, the hermetic tradition and, uh, say, Gnostic teachings about uh, the nature of reality. Uh, you know, I, have you ever heard of Timothy, uh, Timothy Freak? No. No, I have limited background in, okay. in, 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 in these traditions. I, I should have more. I, uh, I'm reading more, and the more I read about it, uh, the more it resonates, and the more I, I, I think I recognize certain things. But no, I don't have an extensive background on it. Right, I understand. Well, to make a long story short, uh, I got CD of him doing a reading one of his books, in other words, about this uh, similar topic that we're talking about. And he uh, describes creation as a big story, and we're all part of the story, which I don't think that's really that far from uh, your theory of dreamed-up reality. It's just really a, a matter of semantics and allegory, I think. What do you think? Uh, based on what you're saying, I think that's right. I think if I would boil down some of my insights and some of my 
favorite hypothesis, if you will, to, 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 a, to a short statement. I would say that the reality is a story within a story within a story. And at each level of this storytelling, we have amnesia of the level before. Uh, and, and that's how we are living every day. And sometimes we have a few escapes, like uh, when we dream, when we have spontaneous so-called spiritual experiences, which probably would be better described as non-materialistic, non-dual experiences, when people see certain types of UFOs uh, uh, or, or fairies or other kinds of so-called absurd experiences. Maybe we have a glimpse behind the, this, this curtain of storytelling. That would make a lot of sense. And, it, you know, people have actually uh, touched bases on this, uh, you know, to some small degree, uh, you know, in other places. But I noticed that, you know, I was checking out your blog this morning after, I, uh, you know, you PM me. Yeah. And uh, you had an interesting post up there that I thought you might want to share a little something about that with us. Uh, Consciousness and Memory was the title of it. And in this here, you go uh, into talking about this beside uh, behind-the-scenes look and how it relates to our dreams. So I thought maybe you could elaborate on that a little bit more. Sure. We, we were talking about you know, reality being a story within a story. Uh, the question then is why do we seem to only perceive one very stable autonomous story you know, governed by stable and unchangeable laws of physics separate from us and just out there. If there are other levels of storytelling, why don't we perceive them? And I think the point I tried to raise in that article, uh, the blog, by the way, is uh, bernardocastrop.com. It's the first mm -hmm. article right there. Is that um, when, we, when we talk about the, a state of unconsciousness, for instance, if we, if we are in deep sleep or if we faint or if we are under general anesthetics, um, all we can say about what happened during that state of apparent unconsciousness was that we can no longer remember whatever might have happened, whatever we might have experienced during that state of apparent unconsciousness. We cannot say that nothing happened, that we had no experience, that there was no storytelling, that there wasn't a lot, another level of storytelling reality uh, during those, those states, because we simply don't remember them. We cannot make a statement beyond that. And it so happens that sometimes people do remember. Occasionally we do remember our dreams. Um, we do have, we do know that teenagers the world over play that uh, fainting game where they basically strangle themselves to go unconscious. And they do that because they experience something that is so fantastic that they want to keep on going back there again and again in a highly risky and not advisable game, by the way, that nobody should do. There are safer ways to do this. Right. Um, or spiritual techniques like holotropic breathing, where you hyperventilate until you faint, until you go unconscious, and then you have a spiritual experience, while everybody else thinks that you're just lying there unconscious and not experiencing anything. Uh, these are glimpses, maybe, to other levels of storytelling that in our culture we associate associate to a lack of consciousness, while in fact it's, it may be just a lack of memory formation, an impairment of memory formation, but not at all a lack of stories. Well, you know, it's an interesting thing. <clears throat> not long ago, I had a radio show host on as a guest. He's also, also an author, and he has a book out called Magic, Mysticism, and the Molecule. His name is Micah Hanks. He, uh, his show is The Gradient Report. And he goes into a great deal of detail about the effects that some of the ancient shamans used to achieve this, like psychedelic drugs, like the uh, mushrooms you mentioned in your article, and uh, other methods like scrying or mirror gazing. Um, he said that, according to his study, this has been something that shamans and people have been doing the world over uh, for as long as time has been around, in other words. There, there's no doubt about that. I think that is pretty much well established in, in anthropology and ethnography. Um, to me, the main struggle was uh, to give myself permission to accept that what's going on there may have some validity. Uh, because in principle, if we just look at our scientific paradigm, uh, uh, consciousness is supposed to be generated by the raw matter of the brain. Um, and if you have an experience because you 
subjected yourself to to major physical stress or to to the ingestion of psychoactive active drugs, then those experiences are merely noise introduced in, introduced into the system by a sort of self-inflicted uh, 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 dissociative process, if you will. In other words, they have no validity, no ontological validity at all, no no reality uh, in, in them. And so I first needed to try, I needed to frame for myself a hypothesis where that could have a validity and that, and that would be rational and consistent with the empirical observations we have accumulated over the past few hundred years. So the hypothesis that I found and which I keep on elaborating on, although I'm not the author of this hypothesis, is that uh, you know, the nervous system, it, it, it doesn't generate perceptions. It doesn't generate cognitions, insights. What it does is to filter down perception. Uh, that's a hypothesis that uh, is called uh, a mind at large. It was popularized by, by Aldous Huxley back in the 50s, although he's not the author. The first person to talk about this was uh, French philosopher Henry Bergson uh, in the late 19th century, and then other people elaborated on this, like Charlie Broad and other people. The hypothesis there is that consciousness is a fundamental property of nature at large. It's not generated by matter. It's as fundamental, say, as electric charge, maybe even more fundamental than that. And as such, any entity that is conscious is in principle uh, able to be conscious of anything and everything that has ever happened, happens, or will have ever happened anywhere in the universe beyond space-time limitations. And the role of the nervous system what it has evolved to do is not to generate consciousness. consciousness. Consciousness is already there from the beginning. It's very fundamental. It's irreducible. What it evolved to do is to filter down consciousness, localize it in, a, in the space-time surroundings of the physical body in order to, to facilitate survival. Hmm. If, you, if, if, you're, if you're conscious of everything that's going on in the universe, you probably wouldn't care much about the survival of your physical body. You wouldn't even be able to focus on it so you wouldn't survive. Therefore, you would not be selected for in evolution by natural selection. So maybe the nervous system has evolved to, to leverage all this, in, all this subjective information, all this qualia that is already there uh, in, from the beginning and filter it down to a very restricted, small, potentially distorted subset um, that would favor survival. That's what it would have been selected for. That's, that, that, may, that may have been our evolutionary history. And then if that is the case, uh, we are dealing with physical filters in our brain and in our nervous systems. Uh, they filter down consciousness. If we could bypass them in some way, we would gain access to a broader reality that exceeds uh, the space-time boundaries of our physical perception, if you will. Maybe that's what shamans throughout the ages through uh, ordeals, through chemical intoxication, maybe that uh, have try attempted to do. Maybe that's what monks attempt to do through meditation, through special breathing techniques that uh, encompass uh, hyperventilation as well, and therefore reduce blood f flow to the brain. Um, all of these things may have this one commonality, which is a way to bypass. Uh, the filters of the brain and allow us to gain access to a broader reality. And of course, it has to be done in such a way that you don't bypass your entire brain completely because otherwise, one, you might not come back, you might be, might be dead. Uh, and two, uh, even if you do come back, if you impaired uh, the mechanisms of your brain too much, you would not have been able to, to form any memories, to articulate anything. So you come back and you think that nothing happened, that you were just unconscious. How do you find this balance of crossing the border, but not so much that you can no longer articulate anything, that you can no longer form any, any memory, or maybe that you can no longer come back? How do you go far enough into the other side, if you will, between quotes, into the, the realm of unfiltered consciousness, unfiltered perception, but still maintain a, a, a foot on this side so you can articulate it, remember it and tell the tale to the tribe. I think that is that is the balance that people in the past have found and, and we have lost. Yeah, and I think we probably lost it somewhere during the dark ages if I was to take a guess, but I have no way to really know that for sure, but it seems like as good a guess as any. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, yeah, and you know, what you're talking about there about the nervous system and the brain, uh, 
keeping your uh, consciousness uh, grounded into your body. It kind of, you know, because I did a lot of study on ancient religious texts and that. And the thing that that brings to mind is some of the thing the ancient spiritual teachers used to talk about called chains of darkness. Can you? Well, in other words, they, they, they don't really go in and elaborate what these chains of darknesses are. But it's something that keeps you bound into this realm that we're in now. And my guess has always been all along that what made sense to me would it would be connected to the five senses. Because even if you read the Bible back in Genesis, it was uh, a desire for the taste of the forbidden fruit that attracted Eve, which would relate to the, you know, five senses or sense of taste, for example. And, uh, you know, the nervous system and the brain are connected. So I think there might be something into what you're saying. And maybe there's a bigger picture to it, in other words. So what you're saying is that maybe uh, the eating of the forbidden fruit was basically this this grounding of consciousness uh, within the filters of the nervous system, which encompasses the brain. When I say nervous system, I mean the brain, your your nerves, your sense organs, everything. That's what I mean by that. Um, it, it could be, right? It, it could be a, a, a symbolic, metaphorical way uh to say this, to 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 go back to this moment in time in our evolutionary history, when our physical body uh, captured uh, consciousness, this fundamental property of nature, as far as we know, uh, into a space-time locale, a space-time locus, and and pretty much put it in prison, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and we seem to be stuck into it in a prison at least during the term of our lifespan here now. One of the other things that you were talking about, and real quick, like I don't want to forget to remind everybody, uh, like you said a minute ago, your website's www.bernardocastrup.com. Your books can be found at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or almost any major book reseller. And also, I have a link up on my site to your book uh, where they can get it at Amazon. And I'm pretty sure you got links up at your site somewhere for it as well, don't you, uh, Bernardo? Sure, they are there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Just got to make a few clicks to find the right one. <laughs> but, um, yeah, what I was th thinking about a minute ago when you were talking is about the memories and not having a memory of past lives or other levels or, as you would call it, <clears throat> it kind of reminds me of reincarnation. And, you know, a lot of people say that, they have actually experienced their past lives and or, uh, people that say that they can regress you through your past life through hypnosis, but it's still, it's all buried within your conscious or subconscious somewhere. So the way through it is somehow in a, a dream type of state or an altered reality, in other words. There's lots to comment on. Um, lots of things came to my mind when I was uh, listening to you. Um, I'm personally fascinated by stories of past lives, although I have a reservation about it. I, I see past lives more as as a, as a metaphor than as something literal. And let me tell you why I think that. Um, whatever the broader reality is that we would perceive if our consciousness was not trapped uh, and filtered down by our nervous system, whatever that is, I don't think it is necessarily bound by the same space and time constraints that, that we seem to live in. For all you know, uh, space and time are creations of this filtering mechanism, uh, survival-oriented creations of this filtering mechanism. So we can uh, pace and stretch our experience in both time and space to make sense of things and react in a way that favors survival. Uh, if that is true, then our true mind, our true consciousness, is not fundamentally subjective, subject to, to, to space and time. And then it no longer makes sense to talk about past lives, because that entails space and time. It entails time in an obvious, obvious way. It's something that has happened to me in the past. And it entails space as well, because it is my past life, not somebody else's past life. And I have a certain place in space and somebody else has another place in space. So it entails space-time. If the true underlying reality of nature uh, is not fully constrained by space-time, then what, what is going on may be 
much broader than that. Nonetheless, as we talk about it from within space-time, past lives may be as good a metaphor as any. It may be as good a way to talk about what is really going on as any. Although you always have the question, if I remember a past life, am I just tapping into the collective unconscious of the species, a repository of all experiences, of all humans, maybe of all conscious entities. Kind of like we, Edgar Cayce's Akashic Records. Exactly. The, the Akashic Records, uh, it, it, it's another name for what Carl Jung, the Swiss psychiatrist, uh, called the, the, the collective unconscious. Collective un the definition of Jung was a little richer. There was more to it. There were the archetypes, patterns of thought. Uh, and, and cognition, it's more than just a repository of memories, but it, it, it entails that as well. So are, are we just tapping into that and remembering a coherent experience that is as much ours as anybody else's, or are we tapping into our own and only ours past life? I don't know the answer to that, and it may not even be important. So long as each one of us can tap into it, what does it matter? Well, it seems like from my perspective, and God knows I don't have no degree in science or any other thing for that matter, but it seems like what would really be the important matter is the actual life you're presently in right now, since that's where you're doing your experiencing at. And there must be a reason for this, uh, right? That, that, that's what I, I have struggled with myself. As I actually wrote a book on this. It's my first book, uh, Rationalist Spirituality, where I, I, I try to discuss... The, the great question of the meaning of existence from, from a grounded, uh, rational perspective, which is, if this is happening, there must be a point to this. I, I do have a, a teleological tendency. I, I, I do have the, the tendency to think that there is a purpose, there, there is a telos to existence, there is a, a goal. It may not be a goal that is realized only at the end. Maybe this goal is being realized at every moment in time. Actually, this is what I tend to believe. But there must be a sense, a meaning uh, to all this. So there must be a sense to this trapping of consciousness in a space-time locality. Um, and and I, risk the, I risk the hypothesis about this in my first book, which is that um, unless consciousness identifies itself with a certain foreground, with a certain... Uh, identity separate from the rest like uh, I, I think I am me and I am not the other people I see I'm not the things the houses the cars the streets the trees I see out there only through this separation between the foreground of experience and the background of the world out there which you can only achieve through filtering consciousness only through that the very concept of information is possible because if consciousness is unbound, uh, you, you, you do not have access to information because information depends on a distinction, on a contrast, on something that is or is not. But it's, op it's, it's polar opposite. It's always there. Um, let me give you an example maybe to try to, to make this uh, a little bit easier to, to, okay. to understand what I'm trying to say. Uh, imagine that a baby is born in a, in a very brightly lit white room with seamless walls, no doors, no windows, seamless ceiling, just pure, bright, white light, 24 hours a day, and that baby has never seen anything else. That baby will be unable to conceive of the idea of white light. It will never know what white light is, because it will never have had the contrasting experience of darkness, or of red, or yellow, or green, only through experiencing a, a polar opposite of something do you really acquire the information of what that something is. This is not a spiritual thing. This is a very down-to-earth engineering thing. Uh, the entire field of uh, information theory, which grounds communications, like the equipment we are using right now to talk to one another, all of this is derived from information theory, uh, which started back in the 1940s. And it, it was based on this very concept that the amount of information in a message, any message, a phone call, a, an IP package on the Internet, anything is determined by how many other things can be differentiated from it. That is the measure of information. So if nothing can be differentiated from it, there is no information. If consciousness is not bound, so it identifies itself to a foreground personality that is distinct 
from a background of experience, the background of the world out there, information is, is, is just not, there isn't a concept of information. So you cannot learn even about yourself. You cannot come up with ideas about who or what you are. And maybe that's the, the very telos, the very meaning of, of this, this trapping of consciousness in, in, in physical nervous systems. It's speculation, of course. Well, yeah, and there's a lot of speculation out there, and uh, I think the only way to find out is to actually pass beyond, and if you were to remember something while you're on the other side, waiting to come back for another level or whatever would be happening, when you got back into the next level, you wouldn't remember it, and I, that sounds like kind of a vicious cycle, doesn't it? <laughs> Pretty much, and uh, I actually I have some personal experience with the difficulty of remembering uh, experiences that uh, that are non-materialist or non-dual, um, and my own um, pet theory about why this happens is that you know to, to to gain access to to the backstage to be able to look behind the curtain uh, that is imposed by you know the evolutionary pressures uh, that built our nervous systems uh, to be able to look behind that we have to bypass certain brain mechanisms, uh, particularly the mechanisms that, uh, that create the ego. Um, but when we do that, we also may impair our ability to, to form memories. So it, it comes together. Uh, the more efficient maybe you are into going to the other side, the harder it is to remember or articulate anything, to bring anything back, to bring any fish back to the tribe after your, your nightly fishing expedition. <laughs> Uh, and and that that in a way is is cruel. It would be so nice if we all could go there at will and come back and talk about it and remember it all. But at the same time, it it might defeat the purpose of this whole game of this whole story, because uh, the illusion would disappear. Right? We would remember. We would figure out. We would know who 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 we really are. What's really going on? And and now the emotional charge, the significance of the whole game that is only there because we think it is for real, uh, it, it, it would vanish and it would defeat the purpose of the game. So maybe it's a good thing that built into it uh, is the difficulty of, uh, of, uh, of remembering anything. <laughs> That's a distinct possibility. I was just sitting here listening to you and I thought to myself, you know, if you was to take a person and have them go out in their own backyard and try to remember as much as what they remembered and then let them come back in, I bet they wouldn't remember half of what it was that they noticed when they was out there in the first place and vice versa, they could work from the inside to the out. Absolutely. And uh, not only wouldn't they remember much, I think we all share this experience, so it's something that everybody can recognize. Uh, memories normal memories of daily experience, daily life, uh, they are also, uh, they are not only elusive, uh, when we remember them, uh, unless they have been pretty strong experiences, uh, they gain a certain quality of irreality, they become diffuse, uh, they, they are not as vivid as, as the original experience. Um, and when we talk about dreams, and when we finally remember our dreams, we seem to tell ourselves that, oh, dreams are not real because they also have this quality of, they are diffused, they don't seem quite real, they are not sharp, the resolution is not, is not as great. But that's the same thing that happens when we, me when we remember something that really happened in waking life in the past. It, that, that memory has the same diffuse experience, uh, 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 the, the same diffuse quality as the memory of a dream. Uh, and yet we make this separation, we say a dream was unreal. And, and another memory was real. Um, there may be other reasons why we make that distinction, but this one in particular I find uh, very striking. And, you know, I was uh, looking at your book while you were talking, and one of the first things you talked about was the tale of an imagined universe. And what I got from that particular chapter was uh, about we're all sharing a you know, a reality that, you know, at the same time, in other words, it's uh, kind of like reality ain't what we think reality is. It's re really being created from within us as we go, if I understood that correctly. Is, uh, or did I misunderstand that? 
No, that's that's that that's that's pretty close to it, I think, uh, and uh, we can even link that to to what I just said about dreams. Um, a, a key difference, I think, between dreams and waking life is that the dream seems to be less constrained, while waking life is constrained by the laws of physics, history, the laws of logic, continuity. Uh, like if you drove your car into your garage and tomorrow morning you go back down, uh, your car probably will still be in your garage. <laughs> it will not be on the other side of town, right? Uh, that, that, that is continuity. Uh, waking life it seems to be constrained by all this, continuity, logic, physics. And dreams are not. Dreams are discontinuous. Uh, uh, characters pop in and out of the picture. Uh, they are not uh, They are not rational. Uh, and they don't obey the laws of physics. You can fly, you know, anything can happen. Uh, but other than these difference in how constrained these two things are, dreams are as vivid and feel as real to us when we are in the dream as reality. So the hypothesis I bring up in the first chapter of the book uh, is that um, reali waking reality, which I call consensus reality, by the way, it's not my my. My, it's not the name I gave to it. This is, an, uh, is a fairly old uh, name, consensus reality. Um, what is going on there is that maybe it is a kind of synchronized dream, a dream with many dreamers, like, like that movie Inception, I think, where many people participate in the same dream. And because many people are dreaming, uh, the resulting dream is the collaborative work of many minds. So no single mind can change the dream at will because there is a lot of momentum to that emergent dream. And I use the word emergent in a, in a technical sense. I, I, don't, I, we don't need, I don't need to explain what emergence is in philosophy and science, but uh, for, the, for your listeners who know what I'm talking about, I, I do mean it in a tec in the technical sense. Um, but our d individual dreams at night, uh, they do not have those constraints because they are, they are our own. They are individual. So we can run the show at will. There are no constraints. In reality, these constraints em emerge because it's a collective story built by many minds, if you will. Uh, that, that's the hypothesis that they, I bring up in that chapter. I do think reality is a little more complicated than that, but I try to limit that chapter to, to this little story, which I think is, is very interesting. Uh, I can't prove it. Uh, I am not even 100% convinced that this is what this what is really what, what is really going on, but I find it very very interesting. Well, I wouldn't feel too bad about not being able to prove it. Uh, science hasn't been able to prove their end of it yet either. So none of the <laughs> oh, parties it, have, if you think about it. <laughs> well, actually, uh, it is surprising how much leading edge science is 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 not accessible by by the public uh, because. Very recently, in 2007, in a paper published in Nature, I can even tell you the number, Nature number 446, uh, I think April 2007 or May, spring 2007, uh, uh, an article was published by a team of uh, Austrian physicists, uh, the latest in a long series of articles on the subject of uh, quantum entanglement, uh, which basically proves that the idea that reality is independent of our minds, which in philosophy is called realism, the idea that the world would go merrily on even if nobody was looking at it, that that idea is not sustainable. It is not true that reality and mind, in other words, reality and our own subjective perception of reality are interwoven. They may be the same thing. They may be two different metaphors for the same thing. This has been all but proven scientifically, although nobody talks about it. It is quite surprising. And if science does prove that, that, that there isn't a, a world out there, really, that it, it is just a play of mind, all of it is not just it, an unfathomable play of mind, then there are so many things we have to explain. Like, why physics seems to be so autonomous, so out of our control? How can that emerge out of a nature that is fundamentally a story in the mind? And maybe we get there, even in science at some point. This is a period of, of transition, I think. That's really very interesting, and I wouldn't say it's beyond the uh, plausible either. <clears throat> I've had uh, Bernardo, not Bernardo, but... Um, 
Bernard Heche on before. Oh, and, yes. You know, you're familiar with him, are you? <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> but he, uh, he's got some similar ideas to your own. And he's also talked about the, you know, what I said earlier about reality not being what uh, everybody thinks it is, uh, that solid matter, for example, is more illusionary than it is actual, uh, you know, here and in your hands type of thing. Yes, it's... It, 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 it. Matter is not really there. If you if you look deeply enough into it, uh, it is not really there. It's something very elusive, and that's what we already know in science. We don't quite know what it is. Uh, science, in a way, is map making. Um, science doesn't really access through direct experience the truths of existence. This is up to uh, to to each one of us individually. Uh, what science does is to create models, to create stories. Uh, like maps are to a city. Science is about creating the maps, not about walking around in the city. Um, the problem is that, not the problem, uh, the, the, uh, a consequence of this, the maps are very useful. We wouldn't be here without those maps. Science is extremely important, and we, we should not uh, hijack it for illegitimate purposes. The, I'm, I'm not anti-science at all. Um, but for as long as you're dealing with maps, when you really come down to the bottom of it, uh, you face an uh, uh, impassable obstacle. Uh, that obstacle in science today is, for instance, superstrings. We are saying that atoms are made of protons, neutrons, electrons, and then those are made of quarks, and then those are made of something else, and then you go all the way down, and then science says, and at the bottom of it all are superstrings, these little things that oscillate. Uh, of course, it begs the question, what the hell are the superstrings? Science doesn't say that. It only says it's something that oscillates. And if you grant us this, that there is something that oscillates, we can build all the rest of this story through mathematics, through the mathematics of those oscillations, and we can explain how everything else came, came into being, how everything else works. But at the bottom of it all, there is a fundamental unexplained thing. And for as long as you're building maps, you're always facing that obstacle. Personally, I think the only way to transpose that obstacle is not to only look at the maps, but to go to the city, walk around it, experience reality. And there is no other way of doing it if reality is really interwoven with mind, other than to look into yourself, to look into your own mind. Try to by bypass the filters in a safe and responsible way and see to what conclusions you come. That may be much better than to hear all the stories that our culture has to tell, religious stories, scientific stories, uh, uh, history itself as a story, uh, cultural stories, and so on. Right. And, you know, we were talking about the scientists, because your second chapter in this book is the insufficiency of science for uncovering the true nature of reality. And I was reading that uh, when I read the book, I had... I read this book a week or so ago, but at any rate, uh, one thing that uh, comes to my mind, because I've talked to other you know, people on my show about this, uh, the fact that science is, um, well, they only want to look at the solid, you know, mechanical, uh, you know, picture. They don't want to look beyond it, uh, what's going on by, behind the scenes, because if, if they can't touch it, taste it, smell it, uh, it doesn't seem to have realism to them, which I find to be unique. Because they admit that somewhere down the line, what's solid is illusionary, but yet they don't want to look beyond. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, you know, science is based on a few fundamental tenets, a few fundamental uh, assumptions, if you will. Um, Thomas Kuhn, the philosopher of science, uh, called this a, a paradigm, which is a set of subjective beliefs and values that is, that is necessary for, for, for you to be able to do science at any point in time. Um, he explains this very well in his book, uh, um, on sci what's the name, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, um, published originally back in the 60s, I, th I think. Last edition is from the 90s. Um, basically what he says is that you need this set of values, subjective beliefs, and assumptions. And the science you make is dependent on, on those beliefs and assumptions. So if you have different beliefs and assumptions, you would do different science. You come to different conclusions. And historically, science has changed very much, very fundamentally, once the paradigm changed. So you're always constrained to that. You, you always have to throw doubt 
into your conclusions based on the paradigm. Recently, and I mean by that uh, the 20th century, uh, the paradigm changed fundamentally in physics. Uh, the, the, the traditional Victorian materialism no longer holds any water since quantum mechanics. And that That's has, true. <laughs> yeah, that has percolated throughout physics, but it didn't go further. The other sciences uh, seem not to have incorporated that into their methodologies. Biology didn't, didn't really incorporate that. Uh, um, computer science incorporated to some extent, although it's a technology, so it's, it, it's more pragmatic, you know, so long as it works, it's, it's good. Computer scientists are not trying to discover ontology. They're trying to build something that works, <laughs> that's all. But the other sciences didn't quite incorporate that. So as a result, um, we still live according to an old and and a node paradigm that it, we already know is, is not quite, quite valid and it shapes pretty much the way we think about science. We still think about science as, um, for instance, a, a big assumption in, in science is that uh, a result only has validity if there are multiple independent observations of the same phenomenon so that there is enough statistics to say, well, that phenomenon is really, phenomenon is really out there. It is not uh, a, a trick of the mind uh, because one person observed the thing under certain circumstances and had an illusion or something. No, sufficient other people observed the same thing under similar circumstances. So what does that tell you? It tells you that reality is out there, independent of mind, observations of the mind are unreliable, so you have to average them out by making sufficient independent observations, and that's your only way to get a, a, a reliable enough picture of this reality that is out there independent of those observations. Guess what? It's not like this. We already know reality is not really independent of observation. This whole paradigm is still throughout you know, most sciences uh, even physics, except quantum physics, you know, uh, particle physics, uh, high energy physics, but in other parts of physics, solid state physics, um, maybe even to some extent astronomy, uh, that, that, that still didn't percolate enough. And that, that's a pity. Yeah, that was something else that me and Bernard uh, discussed. Uh, amongst other guests was the fact that before something actually exists in this dream, as you, uh, as we may want to call it, it has to actually be observed. If you think about it, there is no reality outside of observation. There is only abstractions outside of observation. If there is something that we are sure is real, but nobody has ever observed, it's a belief. It's a, it's a concept of the mind. Uh, if it is observed, then you can say, well, that is, that is, that is truly real to the extent that, it's in, that it exists in observation, the only carrier of reality. But then it's already in the mind. A reality outside the mind, by definition, is mere abstraction. Uh, we cannot make any statements about it. Uh, and that's something that a five-year-old kid knows. Uh, when we grow up, we tell ourselves so many stories, we lose sight of the obvious, right? When you're a five-year-old kid, w what is reality to you as a five-year-old? Reality is a set of moving images, images, perceptions, things in consciousness. That's what reality is. There seems to be one privileged special image, which we call the body, because when that image changes, the other images around seem to change in a corresponding way. Like if you turn around, the other images seem to flash about in such a way that uh, that remains consistent with the position of your body. So it's all images in consciousness with one privileged image. That's something that Henry Bergson used to talk about. I loved him as a philosopher because he philosophizes from the point of view of a five-year-old kid, which I think is fantastic. He won a Nobel Prize, by the way. He was a very, very serious uh, scholar. Um, but later on, people tell us all kinds of stories, like these images only exist in your brain, you know? There are no images in reality, in the sense of images as qualia, as subjective experience. They don't exist out there. They're just inside your brain. What is out there is matter, matter, the subatomic particles. That's what is out there. Now, we don't experience any of this. 
we don't experience images as neuron, neural signal processing in our brains. We experience just images. We don't experience matter as systems of vibrating strings. We just, we just experience images. So everything else is a story we tell ourselves later on, and we, we become so enamored with these stories that we take them to be more real than the immediate contents of experience, to the point that we dismiss our almost intimate experiences if they don't fit the reigning paradigm, if they don't fit the reigning story that is accepted uh, by society at large. Uh, Man or humanity, if you will. I don't want to sound. I don't want to sound sexist here. Humanity has always had a reigning religion. The only thing is that in our times, the reigning religion is scientism, not science. Science is is more neutral. But scientism, the idea that science is the judge and jury of the nature of reality, as opposed to a technique for developing technology, which is what it is. Science is the enabler of technology. It makes predictions about how things work so we can build our toys, we can build our buildings, we can create our medicines, very useful things, very important things. But to say that science explains to us the nature of reality is the new religion of our, of our times, the new religion that gives us the stories that we then use to supplant our own immediate experiences. And that is truly a pity. Yeah, I would tend to agree with you on that. I uh, wanted to mention also, before we get too far down the road, that I will not be having a show Tuesday night at 8 like I usually do. That's mine and my wife's anniversary, so I'm going to take the night off. <clears throat> Pardon me, folks. Congratulations however, to her. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Um, however, folks, I will be back uh, Thursday, which is not one of my usual so, uh, show nights, uh, but it is the only night these two guests is going to you know, be available to make a show, and that's Michael Bastine and Mason Winfield, and we're going to talk about their book, Ira Kell's uh, Supernatural, and oh my God, my pronunciation of that was really poor, but at any rate, I want to invite everybody to, you know, make sure they make that show, and once again, for those of you listening at uh, Shoutcast or iTunes or somewhere else, uh, the website here, if you want to join si uh, the chat or sign up for the newsletter, is www dot paranormalpalace dot com, and my call in number for anybody that wants to call in and ask the guest questions is eight three two six three two seven nine zero four. Call in, and if I don't answer right away, I'm just uh, waiting for an opening because I don't like to, you know, interrupt my guest. And if a voicemail picks up, you can always try right back. Uh, also, wanted to take one last quick plug and let uh, remind everybody. Not to forget to stop by United Paranormal International. Uh, they got investigators and researchers from around the world over there. It's a so, uh, social network. It's a great place to learn, uh, make friends, and meet people. Um, and don't forget also, Bernardo's website is www.bernardocastrop.com. And let's move right on along with this here. Um, now, you, you and me have already talked about the field of the mind as a universal repository of nature, uh, and I was just looking at some of these here in the contents, and I thought we could bring them up uh, as we went. But you was uh, talking about the technologies of mind exploration, and I think you kind of touched bases on that with the uh, psychedelics or, or like mushrooms, or and I mentioned scrying. But have you got any others that we may not have talked about? There are so many uh, in history. Um, the, the, the common factor uh, amongst all these, I think, is that uh, in one way or the other, they all seem to dampen down, to deactivate certain areas of the brain, which, according to the mind-at-large hypothesis, uh, would allow you to bypass certain built-in filtering mechanisms of the brain and, and, and gain perception, gain cognition of a broader reality than the one maybe evolution has confined us to as a, because of a survival advantage. Um, but there are many. Um, the article on my blog today uh, talks a lot about psychedelics because it's a very recent discovery that psychedelics also dampen down the activity in certain parts of the brain. For 50 years, 
We have always assumed in science that psychedelics produce hallucinations, produce mystical experiences by exciting certain regions of the brain that correlate to those experiences. So if there is an area of your, of your brain that produces uh, audio-sensory uh, uh, perceptions, uh, then psychedelics excite uh, that, that part of your brain. So you hear voices, although your ears are not kept, kept capturing any, any signal from the air. Uh, but it turns out that that's not at all what works, uh, how it works. A, a study uh, in, in England, in Britain, at the end of 2010, has shown that uh, psilocybin, the active ingredient of magic mushrooms, actually dampen down the areas of the brain related to ego formation, to identity, location in space-time, precisely those things that seem to filter out uh, the rest of, uh, of the, the, conscious, the field of conscious perception that we otherwise would have access to if not for those filters. So that's why I focus on this. But there are other techniques that have been known for many years to have the same effect of bypassing certain mechanisms, mechanisms of the brain or, or reducing the activity in certain areas of the brain, causing dissociation and things like this. For instance, uh, certain breathing techniques that are common in yoga, they, 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 through, through breathing you cause hyperventilation, the alkalinity level of your blood uh, goes up, the blood vessels in your brain can't take it, so they, 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 they just constrict, reducing the blood flow to your brain, dampening down the activity in certain key areas and producing mystical experiences. Uh, another example, uh, th th there are so many mentioned in the book, it's, it, it's hard even to, to choose which ones to talk about, but brain entrainment, for instance, uh, which is a technique where you use a certain audio-visual vis signals uh, goggles and, and, and headsets that produce rhythm, rhythmic patterns of images and sounds that change uh, the frequency uh, in which your brain operates. And that also seems to have a dampening effect in certain areas of your brain uh, that allow you to bring to awareness certain experiences, inner experiences, that are otherwise filtered out. Uh, and the list goes on and on. Uh, uh, psychedelics are just the latest uh, to be found out to operate in that exact same way, which is very counterintuitive, very counterintuitive. If you uh, have any experience, experience with psychedelics, they produce amazing uh, perceptions, which one would associate to an, excite, an, an excitation of, of brain function, not a dampening down of brain function. If the brain produces, generates conscious perception, the brain should be excited uh, if you're experiencing uh, unfathomable things. But no, the brain is just being dumped down. And the more it's dumped down, the stronger the experience seems to be, which is counterintuitive for the paradigm, but not for the mind, of, mind at large hypothesis. If the filters are being dumped down, of course the intensity of the experience will go up. Okay. <clears throat> I was going to mention, Bernardo, that we've been, been at this about 53 minutes, almost an hour, and I thought maybe you'd like to take a break real quick. I thought I'd check with you and see. Sure. Five minutes? Okay, we can do five minutes if you like. All right, I will take a bio break. <laughs> I'll be back here uh, in, in less than five minutes. Okay, then I'll be waiting for you. All right, cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, everybody, we're back now, and I think Bernardo had a disclaimer that he'd like to share with us, and now would probably be a pretty good time to do so. Uh, go ahead, Bernard. It's something I, I talk about in the book. I think it's a good idea that we add here, too. Uh, all these techniques we talked about, the so-called spiritual techniques for bypassing brain filters and gaining access to, to a broader reality, if you will, um, all of them entail certain risks. Uh, even the one that apparently is the most harmless of them all, uh, meditation in its countless forms. Uh, a few years ago, a paper was published in which dozens of potentially dangerous side effects were, were listed. Maybe the paper was a little bit exaggerated, but things like um, uh, dissociation, mild dissociation, which basically means that you get very confused. You don't know who you are, you don't know where you are. Um, mild forms of uh, panic. Um, all of these things can be induced even by something as harmless as, as meditation, which is the mother of all mind exploration techniques. Um, psychedelics, no need to mention how, how dangerous their, their use can be if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, brain entrainment can, can, can produce seizures if you are sensitive to them because of the blinking lights. Uh, the list goes on, so nobody should do that uh, lightheartedly. These are th serious things. Uh, one should know, should do a lot of homework and know what one is doing before that is attempted. And probably have somebody close by just in case. Oh, that is that is the that is certainly the case at all times. Yes. Well, you know, we were talking earlier about you know things not really existing until they're observed. One of the big questions that would come up for me out of that, though, is who observed the first point of creation the uh, before the Big Bang? <laughs> that is a mighty good question, isn't it? Um, Goes back to the chicken and the egg, too, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, in the book I describe uh, some of my most intense um, experiences of subjective exploration of meditation, if you will, and the insights uh, that came to me. Um, one thing I talk about is the, the non-duality of some of these experiences. Uh, in other words, the, the, the self-referential aspect of it, which is something that you can't bring back and articulate in, in, in a logically clear way. Um, it is just an impression that is very real to you when you are in that experience, but you can't bring back, you can't articulate in a convincing way. It, it will sound contradictory if you attempt to do that. Carl Jung used to talk about it in his books, the non-dual character of the inner psyche, of the unconscious, if you will, the collective unconscious. Um, he, he wrote extensively about it. He used to call the ego uh, the 
petty mind that cannot survive a confrontation with a contradiction, <laughs> which is a beautiful way to put it. Um, so what you are bringing up, you know, who observed the Big Bang? Who observed the, the, the beginning of existence? That seems contradictory because it's self-referential. You need to observe the creation of yourself, and that defies logic. The answer I would give to that, which has been the subject of a TEDx talk I gave uh, last spring, last spring, is that we should look at at our own logic. Uh, we think very logically. Logic entails certain assumptions about reality: that things should be either true or false, not both, not neither, either true or false. That's the principle of bivalence. There are many other assumed principles of logic that uh, are taken for granted. In other words, they are self-evidently true. They require no proof. The problem is that it's, it's, it's quite a weak argument <laughs> to say that something does not require proof. Uh, a Greek philosopher already, you know, over a couple of thousand years ago, Agrippa, in his famous trilemma, he, he already made the point that you cannot use logic to defend the validity of logic. No more than you use the Bible to defend the Bible. For instance, uh, that, that, that's a contradiction. So what my, there, are, there are many modern articulations of Agrippa's uh, trilemma, by the way. This is not something that is outdated. On the contrary, it's more and more talked about. There is a view in philosophy today that certain true contradictions do exist. They are not quirks of the mind. They do exist. Contradiction is part of nature, a true part of nature. Um, so what may be at fault when we ask these questions? You know, who created the beginning of everything? How could the creator have created itself? Or, you know, uh, maybe it's our logic that is at fault. Maybe our logic is an aspect of these filtering mechanisms of the brain. It constrains us to thinking linearly, to think bivalent, to thinking bivalently, to thinking logically, if you will. And, but, but that not, that may not be the whole story. Uh, that may be a subset of what is really going on. And we may need to, to transcend that subset if we are to make sense of, of the greatest questions of them all. And I think you just asked one, the question you raised is one of those greatest questions that is, that are very difficult to answer from within the confines of this little story within a story within a story that we ordinarily experience. You know, interestingly enough, uh, I actually read the Kabbalion, which is part of uh, explaining the Hermetic traditions, and one of the things that they mentioned in there was everything is paradox, which is pretty similar to what you're saying here. Uh, and it makes sense if you stop and think about it. I mean, uh, cold and hot or you know, could be considered a paradox without understanding their opposite ends of poles, for example. Yes, uh, the, the, our ordinary mind, our ordinary point of view, if you will, is in, is in what in psychologists call the point of view of the ego. The, the ego is an evolutionary construction. Um, we, as a, as a living system, we stand a better chance of survival if we have desires and fears. Desire to eat, desire to mate, fear of predators, uh, and, and so on. So the ego is a psychological construct favored by, by evolution that gives us that, those localized uh, desires and fears, so we stand a better chance of surviving, therefore we were selected for. Um, but as depth psychology has demonstrated since yeah, the late 19th century, you know, people like William James, Sigmund Freud, Carl Jung, they have shown that there is a lot more to the mind than the mere perspective of the ego. That uh, there are many other so-called complexes of the mind. Carl Jung talked uh, in terms of archetypes: uh, the, uh, no, the, 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 the shadow, the self, uh, the anima, and the animus, which represent the human soul. These are different points of view of our own psyche. Uh, they are us, uh, but a part of us that we don't ordinarily identify with. And what Jung says is that. Uh, some of these parts of ourselves, some of these archetypes, some of these points of view of our own psyche that we don't recognize in principle as our own in an ordinary state of consciousness, they do not think logically. They think in a contradictory way, which is 
nonetheless not invalid, according to Jung and other depth psychologists. Uh, it is a very valid way of thinking. It's a different way of thinking, but maybe even more powerful than logic because it's broader. It, it is less constrained. And uh, from the point of view of these un normally unconscious complexes of the psyche, uh, paradox is not a problem at all. It is a, it's, it's, it's a part of nature. It's a part of existence. And sometimes we can assume that perspective. We can assume that point of view very fleetingly. And we gain that insight. We realize how that can be true. And we realize that there is nothing wrong with it at all. But then we come back to the ego and we forgot it all. And we are back to the grind. <laughs> so all roads lead back to the beginning. That is true, apparently. Yeah, if, if, if they didn't, the game would stop, right? Well, that is true. And that still leads back to one uh, question, which I think, if I understood you correctly earlier, you uh, touched bases on. And that is, what is our purpose? Why are we here? Uh, why is this big uh, shared reality or dreamed reality uh, being manifested in the first place? I mean, surely it, it had some goal, some purpose, or, you know, a need or what? I will go into very wild speculation territory, um, so bear with me. I, I will attempt my own answer to that. This is my own intuition of today. Uh, my intuition may be different tomorrow. It certainly was different yesterday. I know that I have too. No, <laughs> yeah, I have no reason to believe that I am right about it today and will be wrong about it tomorrow. <laughs> so, uh, so bear with me on this. Um, I think. What might be going on in terms of a purpose, a meaning, a telos to this all is that, um, you know, if, if consciousness is a fundamental property of nature and we have the illusion of an individualization of consciousness, in other words, we have the illusion that we are only us and not everybody else because that's the job of the nervous system. Um, then there is only one actor in this whole story. There is only one conscious entity in this whole story that is playing all roles. You, me, your wife, my wife, the, the dog, the cat, everything, everyone. Um, and when it is playing these different roles, it, it has amnesia. It forgets what it truly is. It, it, it identifies itself with that particular nervous system, that particular body, that particular location in space-time, because there is an evolutionary advantage to that. Now, if there is only one actor, um, then maybe the goal of this whole game is that actor trying to find out what it is. I would certainly have that question. <laughs> I would ask myself this. Um, if I if I didn't have a mirror that I could look at uh, and see what I am, if I didn't have other people around me that interact with me and give me feedback and therefore allow me to build a model of what I am, if I don't have any of it, if there is nothing in the world but me, no mirrors, no other people, nothing outside of me to give me any clue, any hint of what I am, what do I look like, what is it that I am? then I would find, I would try to find a way, try to find a trick to give me that mirror, to give me that interaction, to try to figure out what is it that I am? What is going on? What am I? And maybe the whole of existence is that trick, is that game, is that, um, that way for this one actor to pretend that it's not a one actor, that it's multiple, to create a mirror, to create other people, to give itself feedback, uh, and to forget what it really is, because otherwise the, the whole game wouldn't work. It wouldn't make sense. You, it would see through it. And I use the word it in capital in a very respectful way. Uh, uh, your, your listeners will understand that I'm talking about what most people would call God. Uh, and, and I talk about it in a very respect, respectful way. Uh, I'm not the first one to use the word it for it. The first person to do that was a theologist. Um, I forgot his name. Uh, Alan Watts was the first one. Uh, he's a Christ he was a Christian theologist. And he was the first one to use mm -hmm. the word it, also in a very respectful way. And in that way, I used that, that same word. So I think this might be what, what is going on. It is, 
it's a great show, uh, a, a great theater in which this one actor loses itself in an attempt to figure out what it is. And in the process, he gets to also experience things that he may not have experienced any other way. I think all of it is consists of experiences that it couldn't have experienced in any other way. All of it. Well, that's, you know, my, that's my intuition, at least. Even the Apostle Paul mentioned in the Bible about referring to the Holy Spirit and people being anointed. He was talking about the whole end purpose was that God may be all and in all. In other words, be all a creation, yet at the same time, be inside of his creation, which could sound paradoxical. Uh, but then, too, where do you find the words to describe something like that without being paradoxical? <laughs> you, you can't, because we are immersed uh, in a constrained part of the game. Uh, from within that constrained subset of the game, it is impossible to describe in a complete, robust, and accurate way the whole game. By definition, we are, in a small, we are locked up in a room of a mansion. From that room, we cannot devise and describe the whole mansion. We are fundamentally locked into it. The best we can do is to understand that we are locked in a room and that there is something else going on. That's the best we can do. That has been done in mathematics by Kurt Godel. He, he, he could show from within the constraints of mathematical logic that mathematical logic was fundamentally limited, that there were truths that were not accessible from within mathematical logic. So he could prove that, but he could not describe what those other truths were. I think in science we have the same limitation as far as ontology, as far as the nature of reality. I think we will get to a point that we will be able to prove that there is a lot more going on than we can measure. But we will not be able to describe in objective terms what is it that is beyond science. Only through our own direct experience, our own direct exploration of mind, maybe we can gain some access to that. that, that that's what I think. Well, you know, the thought occurs to me <clears throat> that if we did figure it out, or God, well, I don't see how we could figure it out without God figuring it out, without, you know, once everything's been revealed, wouldn't the game really need to end because what's left, what's new? That's my intuition, too, that... Uh, if we figured it all out, if we remembered everything, the, the game is a game of amnesia. If we remembered everything, uh, I think reality would just dissolve into a mist. Uh, we would see through this and the whole thing would, would just end. If it didn't end yet, it's because whatever its goal is hasn't been achieved yet. Uh, and even when I say this, I sort of, beat myself in the head because when I say that the goal hasn't been achieved yet, that's a very time-dependent statement. It suggests that the goal will be achieved in the future, while time itself may be a, a kind of illusion. But we have no other way of talking about it and make sense, right? We are limited. Um, linear. So we, yeah, we are linear and limited. We have to stick to our precarious metaphors. And I, I think that Personally, what I try to do is, is, is not to say something that is literally true, because I think that is impossible, uh, but to try to convey some hints that help people build a certain truth in their own minds that uh, I myself didn't say, nobody said. They built it themselves uh, based on suggestions and hints coming from others. I think that's as, that, that's as good as it, can, as it can get. I don't want to sound pessimistic here, but uh, that's my intuition. Well, you know, while I'm listening to you, and... Again, this is theoretical. Uh, well, a lot of just about all we've been talking about, I think, is could probably be considered theoretical. However, theorizing can be a lot of fun, if you ask me. <laughs> but listening to you, you said earlier about um, how this here not knowing, not being able to remember, was uh, helpful to evolution. Maybe therein lies uh, part of the purpose. Is as long as we can't remember. We'll keep experimenting, trying to learn, and as we try to learn, we create, and it keeps the ball rolling until it can't roll no more. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, this may very well be what's going on. I think, you know, we, we as a species, we seem to have an inherent need to, to find closure, to find a, a final 
explanation for everything that uh, has happened, everything that is going on, and everything that might happen. Uh, only if we do that uh, does the ego feel that uh, that it can make sense of whatever pain and suffering we have had, whatever crazy and illogical and stupid things have happened to us in our lives. So we need that that closure. We, especially when tragedy tragedy strikes, we, we we need to understand why. What was the point? What was the sense of that? So so we we are always in this search for a causally closed explanation. In other words, an explanation that explains everything that has happened, that gives a cause and a sense and a meaning to everything that happens. Uh, yet this may not be possible. Um, I'm, as, as I grow older, I'm still a young guy, uh, but <laughs> as, as, as I grow less young, <laughs> Roy, <laughs> there you go. I, 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 I accept more and more that uh, this final closure is not possible. And if it were possible, the game would end. The, you know, the, the veil of Maya, as the Hindus call it, uh, would just lift. And uh, who knows uh, what would be reality then? Or would it have to start a whole entire new game uh, just to learn more and to evolve more? Which is what uh, Alan, Watt, Alan Watts used to say. <laughs> That's exactly what he used to say. He had this wonderful metaphor that, um, you know, if you are God, uh, if, you, if you're almighty, you're all-powerful, and you can do anything and experience anything, you would <laughs> this is a metaphor, by the way, a very respectable metaphor, uh, he told. He, he, he doesn't mean this literally, but it's a very nice story. He said, if you, if you could do all that, you would grow bored very soon. And if, if there was a button in your almighty control panel written, surprise, after no time at all, you'd grow so bored, that's the button you'd press. And here we are. <laughs> that, that, that was his story. That uh, This is the result of God having pressed the surprise button, having got lost in, 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 in its own creation and forgotten uh, who it is, what it is. And oh, that's he, interesting. I agree yeah. with this guy, and I've never met him to this day. <laughs> <laughs> so what he said is that after all this would happen, then eventually, because it's impossible for, for things to, to, to develop in any other way, eventually God would find itself again. In other words, we would all remember what's really going on. And then it would press that button once again, and the whole thing would start all over. <laughs> you know, the interesting thing is, for years, I've been saying that, asking people <clears throat> to just imagine that they were God, and they were just floating along throughout creation, if there even was a creation or through an abysmal infinity or whatever it was. And this went on long enough. You would think that God would have to become bored. And, you know, experiencing something through his creation would make a lot of sense to break the boredom, which is the same thing you're saying that that guy said, uh, maybe with slightly different words. Yeah. Th there is a danger uh, in this um, Hindu idea that um, that in essence we are God, because the, the risk in I, I, I do think this is true in a subtle way. Um, but uh, the, the, the danger in this is that um, when we say we, um, we tend to understand the point of view of the ego. Uh, now the ego is not God. <laughs> I don't think the ego is God at all. The ego is just a person. It's just me talking to you right now, or you talking to me right now, or our listeners. These are all the points of view of the ego. That's what we ordinarily experience by far most of our time. So the ego is not God. So what the Hindus mean to use terms from, from depth psychology is that the innermost part of our psyche, our true inner selves, ultimately... That is a manifestation of the divine consciousness, the one consciousness that truly exists. Uh, but it's not the ego. It's not one separate, split apart complex of that consciousness, a limited, infinitely, infinitely a limited subset of that consciousness, which is what the ego is. So the danger of this is that we get ego inflation, that we think, you know, I'm... I, I'm well justified to be the dictator of the world because, after all, I am God. That's a delusion. That's a, that's a, that's that's pathological. Somebody kind of like the uh, chosen people. 
Yeah, well, yeah. I, I believe if, if you believe that your ego is God and therefore you're justified to be the ruler of the world, you need therapy. <laughs> <laughs> but yet there are religions based on divine rights, which kind of uh, says that very same thing, which I don't really buy into it. I, I don't think that uh, God sat there and said, you're my special people. You can go uh, dictate to the rest of the world. Uh, but that yeah, is what that is in some religious beliefs, nonetheless, uh, whether I agree with them or not. You know what I mean? I do. Um, I, I I agree with you when we speak literally. I do think, though, that sometimes religion religions different religions get a lot of hit uh, heat because stuff that is in their scriptures uh, is taken to be literal, is interpreted in a literal way, and then. It's obviously then false, if false, even dangerous, and then people just pound on those different religions because of that. While maybe they were written in a metaphorical way. In fact, the language of our primitive mind is a language of metaphors. It's the language of dreams. Uh, we know that from psychology. Uh, our primitive language is metaphorical, not literal. Literal language is a relatively recent invention. Um, so when those books were written, they certainly were written metaphorically, and there may be profound truths in them. Uh, Aldous Huxley wrote this fantastic book 60 years ago, 70 years ago, I don't remember anymore, called um, The Perennial Philosophy. Uh, Bernie Reich, who, who you interviewed, uh, he's very fond of that book. Uh, Aldous basically looked at all the world's religious and spiritual traditions, and he distilled all of those wildly different metaphors. He tried to find what was the the real thing underlying all that. What what what, what were they trying to say with all those different metaphors? With all with, with that circus of uh, contradictory uh, images, if you will. And he realized that for every single spiritual or religious tradition he looked at, the underlying themes, the underlying message was the same. Uh, and that uniform message behind all that he called the perennial philosophy, the philosophy that has been there across religions and across time in a very consistent way. It's a wonderful book. I would highly recommend it, The Perennial Philosophy by Aldous Huxley. I've heard of that book, and I've also heard of him. Uh, I haven't had a chance to read the book yet, but it sounds like it would be very interesting. But, you know, a minute ago you was talking about people confusing themselves that thinking that they were God in the sense of they're the most high. Now, I, I think that's a big mistake, and it does lead to a lot of trouble. I agree with you on that. The way I usually like to put it, if I was supposed to use an analogy, would be what if you were to perceive God as a big ocean and us as just little drops that enabled him to you know, create individuals, which each drop was connected to and, and a part of, but yet was not the actual whole. Yeah, and even scientifically, I, I like very much that metaphor. There is another form of that metaphor that, to me at least, is more appealing, which is the idea of um, um, how do you call that? You know, when when you have flowing water in a little creek, sometimes it makes um, yeah, my English is limited. A, a little vortex of water. There is a name right. for that. But I forgot what uh, the oh, proper uh, name for that is. I don't know what the proper name, but you're talking about like if you throw a pebble into the water. Little waves would uh, ripple out and uh, no. disperse away from it? No, 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 I don't mean ripples. I mean w when you have uh, fast-flowing water and some stones in the river, sometimes a vortex is created in a water going like circles. Like a whirlpool. Like, exactly, that's what I mean. That's the word. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Royce. Um, so if you, if you look at that, that whirlpool, um, you, your mind creates a concept for it. We give it a name. We, we turn it into an object. It exists in itself. It's a whirlpool. It's there. It's in front of me. I know where it begins. I know where it ends. Uh, I can define a boundary for it. It has an, an autonomous existence. While, in fact, there is nothing there but the same water, just water moving in a certain way. But there is no whirlpool. The whirlpool is a concept in our minds. And uh, if you strictly, strictly, strictly look at the world from a scientific perspective, even today's scientific perspective. We don't need to 
you know, to wish for science to be more advanced. No, even today's scientific perspective. The stuff we call objects are just temporary arrangements of atoms, atoms that are in constant movement. Uh, and they come together just like the water molecules in the whirlpool to make up objects that have a transient existence in time and space. They, all of those objects will eventually dissolve and become something else. The atoms in our body have been in the, in the nucleus of stars in the cosmological past. This is literally true. Every carbon atom in your body has been in the interior of a star at some point in the past. Today, they are us. At some point in the past, they were stars. Tomorrow, they will be something else. So everything that we conceptualize is just like the whirlpool. It's a temporary, transient arrangement of atoms and molecules, whatever atoms and molecules may be, whatever images we are trying to, to refer to when you use these names, atoms and molecules. Um, so in that sense, the whole world is, is just as transient and there is no such a thing as you and me from a strict perspective. We are just transient arrangements of stuff, of images. So one of the best things that we ought to do is enjoy this here transient period while we're here because we're not going to be able to enjoy it from the past or from the future. And all we really have for ourselves is the now until we're maybe, you know, in a different level. I think that is true, yeah. <laughs> that is certainly true. Got to learn to appreciate what you have got. And that's really gets to be easy to do when you haven't had it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe it's even more than just to enjoy. I mean, uh, you know, observing people, again, I'm, I'm a young guy. I'm 37. Um, so I haven't learned much yet. I think there's a lot to learn, but... Based on what I have observed in people so far, I, I, I think I see at least two types of people. There is one type that is like me, that is my type, which is people who are trying to figure something out. They're trying to find the answer to something. They haven't quite figured out the question yet they are asking. They don't quite know what the question is, but they know there is a question, and they're trying to figure out the answer. Um, and there is another type of people who are much more how should I put it, love-oriented. They are much more feeling-oriented. It's not about figuring anything, else, uh, anything out. It's about feeling, feeling things in an intense, meaningful way, whether it's sorrow or love, uh, happiness or sadness, feeling. That's what they are, they, they are trying to have in their lives. So in, in our dual world, maybe these are the two paths. I, I don't think it's all about having fun. I think a life spent... Just having fun, maybe it's not a life well lived. Uh, poets talk about it, right? Uh, a life without sorrow is not a life well lived. Who said that? One of these English romantic poets. Not sure whether it was Keats or... Well, I don't, I don't remember anymore. But I think there is some truth to that. Well, yeah, it's all part of the bigger whole. I mean, if you're going to experience uh, without... How do you really truly experience life without contrast is what I'm thinking. I mean, uh, if you're sitting there in a cold bathtub and th there's no such thing as hot water or hot water heater, you'll never know what hot or warm is. So you got a partial experience. You know, you were talking about this yourself earlier. So, you know, you have to have opposite poles if you want to have hot, cold and warm so you can experience the full spectrum Absolutely. I think that's the name of the game uh, in this realm or story that, that we are living. Um, it's, it, it's the game of duality, the game of contrasts. I think that's what it's all about, at least in, in, at this level of universal existence, if you will. I don't know what other levels there might be. I have an inkling that there are many, many other levels. But in this one, I think duality is the name of the game, the contrasts. Now, see, there's an interesting thought that I'd never had occurred to me before. And I've had a lot of thoughts occur during my uh, studies of ancient religions, uh, ancient myths, uh, you know, Egypt and things like this. You, you read a lot online. You see a lot on TV. But I never really caught the con uh, had the concept come to me before that the next level or next life, some people might want to call it, could really be such a totally drastically different animal that you may not even recognize it from this one. I don't think we can describe all truths 
through language. Uh, our language reflects the limitations of uh, the realm of experience we are immersed in. Um, there are built-in limitations to language. For instance, um, we tend, our language captures the notion of subject and object. Uh, I went to that town. I am the subject. That town is the object. Um, that is built into language. So to, to describe anything in language, we need this separation between object and, and, and subject. That's only one example. There are many other examples of things that are built into language and which make it powerful to describe things in our ordinary reality, but make it fundamentally limited to describe anything in any other level of perception that one might gain access to through meditation, for instance. So, no, I don't think... I don't think anybody ever said that language can describe everything. And whatever cannot be described in language cannot be communicated, cannot be talked about. So we are in a, in a very fundamental way, we are very isolated from one another when it comes to things that cannot be described in language. We, ju we just cannot talk to each other about it. We have to experience it all in our own and, and hope that we maintain our psychological stability, not to consider ourselves nuts. <laughs> yes, yeah, very interesting because I've actually read um, on different websites that symbolism was the tool that the ancients used to try to describe what language could not uh, describe. That is very powerful indeed. I, I'm not an expert in that at all. Uh, I, I'm, I'm an expert in very few things <laughs> and even then I'm not, I'm not a very good expert. But... Um, I have a little statue uh, in my desk, the desk where I'm sitting right now. It's the, um, the dancing Shiva statue. It's very, very common in Southeast Asia. Um, and the, it, it's a Hindu symbol. And uh, they describe the universe, the universe we perceive, they describe it metaphorically as the dance of Shiva. It is interesting because dance is one of the few art forms in which the art work cannot be separated from the artist. You know, it's not like a painting. You put something on a canvas and then you have the painting and the artist is somewhere else. No. Dance, in dance, the art and the artists are one. So they, the Hindus call the universe the dance of Shiva, basically implying that Shiva is the universe. And there is this little statue here of Shiva dancing with his four arms in a certain position and, and in a circle around it with rays coming out. And it is a powerful symbol in a way that I cannot pin down. I cannot explain or make sense of w with my rationality. Uh, but I, I, do believe in, I do believe that there is power to certain symbols that transcend the power of language, yes. And from psychology, we know that. Jung has written extensively about mandalas, for instance, which I also discuss uh, in, in, in my book, in Dreamed Up Reality, uh, because I, I have seen those in certain uh, subjective states of meditation. I have seen those symbols in, in a very concrete way. So there is something about symbols. We know it from psychology. I don't know exactly where that comes from, but they speak a language that appeals to part of the, of the psyche that, uh, that are not very rational. I was also going to mention the fact, because I don't want you to get out of here before we uh, cover this part of the book, is the part where you had those um, images. Uh, actually, toward the end, I think you also had some computer language down here, too. But you were um, like the computer code part. That's what part I was looking into. Um, that you wrote down in the book for people that, you know, might want to check this out. Now, do I understand correctly that uh, this would be kind of like a binary model of reality if it was run through a computer, or did I uh, misunderstand that? Well, I, I, I'm not that ambitious, uh, Royce. I didn't try to, to, to model reality. Um, I don't think phys the whole of physics with all its resources can really do it in any complete way. Uh, what I tried to do was to capture my own insights uh, from different meditative experiences, capture that in a coherent way. And because I'm a computer scientist, m my language is, is, is computers. I'm familiar with it. I, I, I'm fluid in it, if you will. So I put together a little 
computer model, but it's a model of my insights about nature. It, it's not intended to be a model of nature. It's certainly not that. I just try to bring my insights together in, in a coherent framework that would allow me to derive the implications of those insights in a very strict, rigorous way, as opposed to just talking about it. That's what I attempted uh, in, that in that chapter. Okay. It so turns out that some of, some of the things that were simulated, some of the results of those simulations <laughs> Uh, were consistent with observations, <laughs> and uh, that that was a bit of a surprise and, uh, and a very curious one. Uh, ideas like uh, entropy, for instance, or or how uh, the organization of uh, of of life seems to contradict entropy to some extent. All of that seems to emerge from those little toy models uh, in the last chapter of the book. Uh, I, I find that quite curious. I think it's worthwhile having a look at that. I find it very unique. Um, there was also another part that you did with the uh, blocks, white blocks and uh, black blocks. Can you, would you like to, you know, kind of explain that uh, for my listeners? Yeah, that, that's basically what uh, we call a cellular automaton uh, model. It, it, it's one way to model phenomena um, by means of cells in a computer grid. Uh, the cells are allowed to have two colors, black or white, which you could construe as dead or alive. And uh, we, determine, we define some rules for how, how these cells behave with respect to themselves and their neighbors. And then we set the system loose to run according to those rules, and we see what happens. These systems have been used to, to model life, for instance. Uh, cellular automata systems have been used to model the dynamics of life, the dynamics of animal populations, ecosystems, and so on. Uh, and in my case, I was trying to model this dichotomy between entropy and order, chaos and organization, by using this, this model with black and white cells and seeing whether they would form patterns, black and white patterns that make sense, or whether, whether they would descend into, into total chaos and disorganization like a, a detuned television set in which you just see you know, chaotic dots of black and white. And uh, yeah, as you can see in the book, some of, some of the images that emerged were, were quite striking. And uh, yeah, I had a lot of fun with that. <laughs> it looks like you did. Um, earlier, you mentioned that you... Uh, about writing something in your first book, which indicates to me you got more than one book, because until I talked to you, I had no idea of how many books you had. <clears throat> so can you tell me how many books you have got out there? I've written uh, three books. Um, they, they sort of, you don't need to read any of the other two uh, to, to understand any single of those books, any single one of those books. But they form a, 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 a whole, if you will. They are kind of trilogy. Uh, two of them are already published, that is Rationalist Spirituality, published in January this year, and Dreamed Up Reality, published in July. And the third one is called Meaning in Absurdity, uh, and it will be pub published in January of next year. And uh, in this third book, I, I elaborate more on that topic that we discussed earlier about uh, logic, uh, reality being uh, a, a reflection of mind and therefore not necessarily having to obey the constraints of rationality, the interplay of the unconscious as described in depth psychology and uh, some of the latest experiments in physics laboratories related to quantum entanglement, how, how that all comes together. And then I go on a limb and I try to suggest not an explanation, that's too ambitious a word, but some hypothesis for how to interpret absurd phenomena in the light of the framework that I, that I discuss in the book. Phenomena like uh, uh, UFO sightings, uh, alien abductions, uh, um, visions and fantasies, uh, uh, psychedelic experiences, um, and so forth. Okay. Basically trying to address what role does absurdity have in reality. Is it purely an illusion or does it have ontological validity? That's the third book. It's coming up in January. I imagine I'll be back in touch with you in January to see if you want to come <laughs> back and talk about it. <laughs> sure thing. Uh, we can set up already an appointment. <laughs> but um, also, I'd like to give you a chance to tell my listeners about any other events you might have coming up in the near future. I, I don't tour. 
Um, I have a full-time job. Uh, writing books for me is um, it is my passion, uh, but it's not something I'm full-time dedicated to. So I'm, I'm basically uh, giving uh, radio interviews, writing articles, uh, but I'm not touring. Um, uh, the talks I give are, are very limited. Uh, uh, I've given a talk recently in a TEDx event. If, if there is a large event uh, that I'm invited to, I, I usually go. But I don't. Uh, I, I'm not really touring, so I, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> oh no, that's okay. Also, <clears throat> coming up November the 11th, uh, this one coming up uh, now, uh, 2011. I was going to let all the listeners remind them real quick that in Los Angeles there's going to be an event called the Alchemy Event 11 11 11, which uh, <clears throat> is supposed to have a lot of people there <clears throat> talking about UFOs, uh, spirituality, uh, anything <clears throat> in the supernatural considered realm. Um, it's going to be t- discussed at this event. It's going to have very you know, a whole lot of speakers, in other words. And you know, I actually had David Farman on my show last week or earlier this week. Uh, discussing this here event that's coming up, and he sounded like he was really excited about this. And, well, I wanted to make sure that I give everybody a chance to know that the event is there. And if you look at the front page of my website, you'll see the logo uh, down toward the bottom. Just click on that, and it'll take you right to it. I also want to let everybody know that, you know, Bernard uh, Bernardo's um, website, Lincoln, is right here on my front page, and I put it in the chat room while we were talking, is www.bernardocastrop.com. And that might probably Castrup, wasn't it? Yeah, Castrup. K A S T R U P. Anyway, his link's right underneath this picture, right under the uh, chat room y'all are all in right now. Now, I was uh, going to let everybody also know that later on tonight or tomorrow, I'll be taking uh, this interview off the front page and moving it to the. Uh, archives to make room for my next show coming up but uh, his picture uh, this actual interview all his uh, bio info and the link to his book will all be right there in the archive easy for y'all to find and you know feel free to share it with everybody uh, you like my show um, is a pretty good guess that other people will too uh, take my link pass it around share it take Bernard- uh, Bernardo's and share his link as well um, Bernardo, we've been at this for like an hour and 42 minutes, and I'm going to try uh, to not go an entire uh, two hours because I've just recently started broadcasting from my own site, and I'm still experimental with it. Uh, one of the things I'm having is I'm sharing these shows on YouTube. After I end them, I uh, get my movie maker out, and I put your picture and my picture and your book cover and all into this deal and add the, uh, the show's audio to it, and then I upload that to YouTube and, you know, Break.com, Daddy Motion is some of those, and uh, some of those places don't like to accept anything that's over an hour, and I like to be able to split it in two instead of three or whatever and have it within that hour time frame, in other words. It just seems to be a little bit neater and not as much uploads to their site, in other words, so until I get that one mastered, I, I'm going to try to fall just short of a two-hour interview. I hope uh that's all right with you. <laughs> sure, of course. <laughs> uh, I used to broadcast over at Blog Talk Radio uh, for about five years there, and right up until the time they started charging, and it was more than I could afford, and that's when I decided to do it on my own here at my site. And, well, you know, you got to learn. Uh, everything has a learning curve, and, well, we learn by doing. <laughs> <laughs> sure. But it's, it's it's been a very interesting hour. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Uh, I think it's been a great interview. Um, and I guess, basically, have you got any last-minute thoughts you'd like to share with us? No, I think you've covered the territory pretty thoroughly. I had a lot of fun, too. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you did. And uh, I tell you what, I still got your email. Uh, I think you still got mine if you want to stay in touch. And, you know, when your next book gets ready to come out, you know, let me know. I'll be more than happy to, you know, have you come back and we can talk about it, uh, you know, Kind of like we did this one, as far in depth as we can take it. <laughs> Once it's out, I'll make sure you have a copy as soon as possible. Okay, well, thanks. I really appreciate that, Bernardo. And um, I saw we got 15 minutes left, but I'm going to go ahead and cut her down right here, I guess, for now. And uh, we'll talk at you at a later date. And I wanted to, once again, thank you. Really have enjoyed it. And 
I want to thank you listeners for joining the show. I couldn't have a show without listeners. Uh, I mean, it wouldn't be any fun to say the, the very least. <laughs> <laughs> All you folks listening at uh, Shotcast and iTunes, come over and visit me at my site, www.paranormalpalace.com. I send out a free newsletter letting everybody know my shows before they actually uh, come live on the air. And Bernardo, you have a good day, and I hope you enjoy your weekend. Thanks for having me, Royce. It was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it a lot. Thank you, and I really enjoyed it, too. Take care. Take care. The reality is a story within a story within a story. And at each level of this storytelling, we have amnesia of the level before. Uh, and, and that's how we are living every day. And sometimes we have a few escapes, like uh, when we dream, when we have spontaneous so-called spiritual experiences, which probably would be better described as non-materialistic, non-dual experiences, when people see certain types of UFOs. Uh, uh, or, or fairies or other kinds of so-called absurd experiences. Maybe we have a glimpse behind the, this, this curtain of storytelling. That would make a lot of sense. And, it, you know, people have actually uh, touched bases on this, uh, you know, to some small degree, uh, you know, in other places. But I noticed that, you know, I was checking out your blog this morning after, I, uh, you know, you PM'd me. Yeah. And uh, you had an interesting post up there that I thought you might want to share a little something about that with us. Uh, Consciousness and Memory was the title of it. And in this here, you go uh, into talking about this beside uh, behind-the-scenes look and how it relates to our dreams. So I thought maybe you could elaborate on that a little bit more. Sure. We, we were talking about you know, reality being a story within a story. Uh, the question then is why do we seem to only perceive one very stable autonomous story you know, governed by stable and unchangeable laws of physics separate from us and just out there if there are other levels of storytelling why don't we perceive them and I think the point I try to raise in that article uh, the blog by the way is uh, bernardocastrop.com it's the first mm -hmm. article right there is that um, when we, when we talk about the, a state of unconsciousness, for instance, if we, if we are in deep sleep or if we faint or if we are under general anesthetics, um, all we can say about what happened during that state of apparent unconsciousness was that we can no longer remember whatever might have happened, whatever we might have experienced during that state of apparent unconsciousness. We cannot say that nothing happened that we had no experience, that there was no storytelling, that there wasn't a lot, another level of storytelling reality uh, during those, those states, because we simply don't remember them. We, uh, my education was in, in engineering. Uh, I have a, a PhD in computer engineering. I've worked in physics laboratories uh, in different countries, like uh, CERN in Switzerland and uh, Philips Research in, in the Netherlands. And... Um, mm. So I have this very rationalistic background, and uh, I used to think uh, until a few years ago that you know science was very close to finding out the answers to all the important questions, and you know the, the only thing that is missing are a few details and fine tuning here and there. Um, but then I realized that no, no, that, that that is not the case at all. Because the more you get into science, the more you you realize what the game really is, what, how science really works, what are the, the underlying assumptions of science and how they may not be valid after all. And, um, and largely motivate, motivated by some personal experiences I, I've had, uh, I got into this, into, into this attempt to, to look beyond uh, the strict process of scientific methodology to, to basically stick to more basic stuff like empiricism, rationality and logic and try to look behind the curtains and, and see what is in there. And uh, it's been quite a ride uh, so far. <laughs> well, you know, when I was reading your book, it sounded like it was quite a ride. But I, I thought you made some excellent points in there. And uh, I don't know if this is going to surprise you or not, but while reading it, I, I was re kind of reminded of uh, the hermetic tradition and, uh, say, Gnostic teachings about uh, 
the nature of reality. Uh, you know, I, have you ever heard of Timothy uh, Timothy Freak? No, no, I have limited background in okay. in, 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 in these traditions. I, I should have more. I, uh, I'm reading more, and the more I read about it, uh, the more it resonates, and the more I, I, I think I recognize certain things. But no, I don't have an extensive background on it. Right, I understand. Well, to make a long story short, uh, I got a CD of him doing a reading one of his books, in other words, about this uh, similar topic that we're talking about. And he uh, describes creation as a big story, and we're all part of the story. Which I don't think that's really that far from uh, your theory of dreamed up reality. It's just really a, a matter of semantics and allegory, I think. What do you think? Uh, based on what you're saying, I think that's right. I think if I would boil down some of my insights and some of my favorite hypotheses, if you will, to, 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 a, to a short statement, I would say that they've inflicted uh, a, a dissociative process, if you will. In other words, they have no validity, no ontological validity at all, no, no reality. Uh, in, in them, and so I first needed to try. I, I needed to frame for myself a hypothesis where that could have a validity, and that and that would be rational and consistent with the empirical observations we have accumulated over the past few hundred years. So the hypothesis that I found, and which I keep on elaborating on, although I'm not the author of this hypothesis, is that uh, you know the nervous system it, it it doesn't generate perceptions. It doesn't generate cognitions, insights, what it does is to filter down perception. Uh, that's a hypothesis that uh, is called uh, a mind at large. It was popularized by, by Aldous Huxley back in the 50s, although he's not the author. The first person to talk about this was uh, French philosopher Henry Bergson uh, in the late 19th century, and then other people elaborated on this, like Charlie Broad and other people. The hypothesis there is that Consciousness is a fundamental property of nature at large. It's not generated by matter. It's as fundamental, say, as electric charge, maybe even more fundamental than that. And as such, any entity that is conscious is in principle uh, able to be conscious of anything and everything that has ever happened, happens or will have ever happen anywhere in the universe beyond space-time limitations. And the role of the nervous system what it has evolved to do is not to generate consciousness. consciousness. Consciousness is already there from the beginning. It's very fundamental. It's irreducible. What it evolved to do is to filter down consciousness, localize it in, a, in the space-time surroundings of the physical body in order to, to facilitate survival. Hmm. If, you, if, if, you're, if you're conscious of everything that's going on in the universe, you probably wouldn't care much about the survival of your physical body. You wouldn't even be able to focus on it so you wouldn't survive. Therefore, you would not be selected for in evolution by natural selection. So maybe the nervous system has evolved to, to leverage all this, in, all this subjective information, all this qualia that is already there uh, in, from the beginning and filter it down to a very restricted, small, potentially distorted subset um, that would favor survival. That's what it would have been. Hello, everyone. Oh, sorry, I forgot to do the intro. Welcome to Paranormal Palace Radio, where truth equals reality, and truth is often stranger than fiction. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Paranormal Palace Radio. This is your host, uh, Royce the Redneck Radio Man, and joining me today is going to be Bernardo Castro. We're going to talk about uh, dreamed up reality and what he has to say about it and he's read a whole book on this so let me get him on the phone real quick or in, in here with me and we'll go from there hey there hello Bernardo hey Royce how are you doing I'm doing pretty good I had a last minute restart, lost my signal, didn't know if it was the computer or if it was my internet service provider, so, so I did a restart just hoping for the best. Let's hope it doesn't happen halfway through it. <laughs> I know, you had to depend on other people for your signal, you can get scary sometimes, but uh, yeah, let's go for it and make the best out of this, and I want to let you know, I, I just, before uh, putting you on the line here, I went ahead and started the show so that we could go from there, and I gave you a 
you know, quick introduction there. And I mentioned it about your book and what with today's gonna, you know, we're gonna talk about today. So, so all this uh, already happened. Pardon me? This already happened. You already gave an introduction. You said. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. I understand. It was a kind of a brief one, though. Uh, and you know, in all honesty, you could probably do a better job than what I was doing uh, based on a bio, because uh, I usually ask my guests to, uh, you know, tell the listeners a little something about themselves and what got them interested in their particular area of interest. So if you want to start this out, I think that'd be a great way. Uh, you know, tell them what was it that got you interested in, uh, you know, reality research, I guess you could call it, couldn't you? Sure. Sure. Uh, we can talk about that. Yeah. Okay. So what was it that, you know, first sparked your interest in this? Uh, are we on air? Uh, right? yes. Just, okay. yes, sir, we are. Okay. Um, well, as you probably saw in my bio, I, I, my original background is, is very scientific, even scientistic, I, I, I dare say. I cannot make a statement beyond that. And it so happens that sometimes people do remember. Occasionally, we do remember our dreams. Um, we do have, we do know that teenagers the world over play that uh, fainting game where they basically strangle themselves to go unconscious. And they do that because they experience something that is so fantastic that they want to keep on going back there again and again in a highly risky and not advisable game, by the way, that nobody should do. There are safer ways to do this. Right. Um, or spiritual techniques like holotropic breathing, where you hyperventilate until you faint, until you go unconscious, and then you have a spiritual experience, while everybody else thinks that you're just lying there unconscious and not experiencing anything. Uh, these are glimpses maybe to other levels of storytelling that in our culture we associate, associate to a lack of consciousness, while in fact it's, it may be just a lack of memory formation, an impairment of memory formation, but not at all a lack of stories. Well, you know, it's an interesting thing. <clears throat> not long ago I had a radio show host on as a guest. He's also, also an author. And he has a book out called Magic, Mysticism, and the Molecule. His name is Micah Hanks. He, uh, his show is The Gradient Report. And he goes into a great deal of detail about the effects that some of the ancient shamans used to achieve this, like psychedelic drugs, like the uh, mushrooms you mentioned in your article, and uh, other methods like scrying or mirror gazing. Um, he said that, according to his study, this has been something that shamans and people have been doing the world over uh, for as long as time has been around, in other words. There, there's no doubt about that. I think that is pretty much well established in, in anthropology and ethnography. Um, to me, the main struggle was uh, to give myself permission to accept that what's going on there may have some validity. Uh, because in principle, if we just look at our scientific paradigm, uh, uh, consciousness is supposed to be generated by the raw matter of the brain. Um, and if you have an experience because you subjected yourself to, to major physical stress or to, to the ingestion of psychoactive active drugs, then those experiences are merely noise introduced, in, introduced into the system by a sort of 